You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Yeah, Alan, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, so much uh, for joining uh, Something Rather Than Nothing. Um, this is a podcast I've been doing uh, since July, and as you might have seen with some of the questions, um, we kind of uh, look into uh, more of the creative components of you know creating a piece of art. And um, I am a lover of uh, literature, and I found it extremely curious that I, I I really haven't had any writers on the on the program yet, and. Um, uh, was listening to your um, to your new um, book, which is, I'm actually listening to it on audiobook. Um, Nothing more dangerous, and uh, uh, like all all your books, it starts out um, and just it just pulls you right in. So um, uh, I want to thank you for um, accepting an invitation to join uh, to join the podcast, and uh, wanted to welcome you to something rather than nothing. Well, I'm glad to be here, and. Um, I think your story is 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 an interesting one, at least from components that I, that I've read about you and about um, your process. Uh, and I and when I looked at your list of books, um, I started listening with the your first one, which is the the life we bury. Uh, that was followed by the guise of another. Uh, after that was uh, the heavens may fall, the deep dark descending. The shadows we hide, and what I had just mentioned, uh, nothing more dangerous. I was rather surprised that you were already up to <laughs> up to six books. How's that feel to you? It went rather quickly. Um, I uh, I didn't step into this thinking I was going to do a book a year, but uh, it's worked out that way. Yeah, and on yeah, the schedule, I think uh, you've had uh, basically a new volume come out um, in in the fall, pretty consistently. Is that correct? October and November. Yes. Yeah, and and prior to that, uh, part of your story is that you were um, a practicing uh, legal counsel, and fair to say, had always thought, or there was this uh, seed of of you looking into and, and wanting to uh, write creatively, um, but you started to to develop that way towards the end of your legal career. Is is that how it worked? Actually, to go back a ways, um, I was kind of a, a ne'er do well in high school. I was I started high school as someone who hated school and just wanted it to be done. But I got involved in theater my freshman year and just fell in love with it. Found something I was passionate about, um, and it was theater that led me to even consider going to college. And I went to college, got a degree in journalism, uh, and then just for no good reason got a law degree. And it's when I got out of law school and started practicing law as a criminal defense attorney that I began to miss that creative side that I fell in love with in theater. And so I started looking around, and it was 1992, I started looking around for something I could do that would spark that creativity and turn to writing. And so I, you know, I, I wrote a short story in 1992, began reading books on writing craft and technique to try and make that story better and that, that blossomed until 2014 when i published my first novel and so in your in your in your professional work and i think a lot of workers can encounter this um uh, given that you obviously had a uh, you know that that kind of creative need in, in in creative side that you wanted to to develop more um, did did you find yourself within within your work trying to to bring that out, or did you feel that you needed just you know uh, uh, another another outlet? I felt I needed another outlet. Um, the legal profession has some creativity to it, especially when you're a criminal defense attorney, uh, but it is limited. Uh, so, and also you're 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 given parameters of how creative you can be where. As a writer, I can be as creative. I can do whatever I want. I have free reign. So it really was a need to to be more than more creative than what I was doing as a as an attorney. Yeah, um, 
and 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 so f- for you, you had mentioned theater um, is 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 an influence, um, and probably on your on your creative uh, development. Are there any other art forms that you that 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 you enjoy or participate in that that inform uh, your writing? I enjoy most forms of art. Um, I participate in only writing uh, because that's the only thing I <laughs> have a desire to to develop. But again, you know, back when I was in theater, I, I love going to plays. I love theater. Um, it, it always impresses me how, especially in theater more than movies, how moving it can be, how emotional you can get watching a good play. And thinking about you know, what's really happening is a playwright writes these words on a page. These actors take these words and they pr- perform this. And what they're doing is they are unlocking the emotion inside the audience. Uh, and and that is actually that that is something that I think is important to all art forms. Uh, Leo, Leo Tolstoy once wrote that the purpose of art is to communicate to others the deepest feelings of humankind. And as a writer, I like that notion that what I'm really doing isn't trying to tell a story, but I'm trying to unlock emotion, trying to evoke something and engage someone in a way that makes them feel something. And so um, the two art firms that really do it for me are writing and are reading and theater, but all art forms interest me. Yeah, and I think I, I mean, in, in, in talking about your books specifically, they 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 uh, they revolve around uh, some main uh, characters. And if you know some of the listeners have uh, listened or, or, or read uh, your books, um, uh, there's um, Joel Talbert uh, character, um, Bodie Sandin, who is the uh, the main character in in, in your new, newest uh, novel, Max Rupert and Lila Nash. Um, these for for those who have listened or, or read your books, they'll have more of a connection to these characters. But one of the things I found in having uh, read each of your works is that they really evoke a lot of um, a lot of emotion and a lot of where you place yourself in in the mind of um, of these characters. And I found this at first to be curious for me because the some of the situations you know that are within a typical you know mystery or or a thriller genre seem kind of you know not not of the norm right and that drives you know that drives uh the drama but when you mentioned that quote by tolstoy in in, in speaking about uh, plays your characters really do bring that up and i i actually felt it um uh really deeply as your characters you know struggle with kind of like moral and, and, and ethical questions about how to how to act and you know w- w- whether they're good whether they're bad um, people so the stories uh, they have this feeling that they come out in in your work of, of really a, a story that needs to be told although you know they're they're creative so that leads to why why do you create i mean did, did did some of the forms of these characters and the situations that they faced did that did, did it really just kind of well up as a natural process um for you like as far as your creative process what what really launched you into having to write these stories and creating these characters okay well to begin with um i do not write a series most mystery writers write a mystery series with one protagonist going from book to book. I don't do that be- for a couple of reasons. Number one, my first protagonist was a college student, and I didn't want to have him tripping over dead bodies and solving crimes. So what I did was I wrote about the community of people I created in the life of Barry. So the life of Barry, my debut novel, has Joe Talbert, a college student, as the protagonist. The next three books, um, they are... Well, there are th- there are three book story arc for Max Rupert. He's not the sole protagonist until the third book of the of the series of the of the arc. Um, but it shows him going from being this man who follows the rules and is a Boy Scout to questioning that in the in the heavens may fall to facing his darkest nature in the deep arc descending. And so I like writing character arcs, whether that happens in a single book or in a you know, three books or, or more. Um, 
I like that journey that the character takes and the crucible that changes the, the protagonist from seeing himself, herself, the world a certain way at the beginning of the novel and seeing themselves differently at the end. So I, because I love that arc, um, I am focused on changing the character. And to change the character in, in a mystery novel, you're not going to change the character by having really good twists and turns. It's important to have that. I, I outline that to the nth degree to make sure that, that I have a really solid mystery that is compelling and um, twisty and interesting. And when I'm finished with that, I look at it and say, now I could write this novel and it would be a mystery novel and that would be it. But I start another outline and this is the personal character, the, the character drive, the character plot. What is it that this character is going to go through over the course of this novel? And it's got to be a personal story. And so I write a whole second plot line that focuses on deeper themes, deeper relationships. Uh, and th th this is what changes the protagonist over the course of the novel. And I think it's that second outline that has been the key to my success. Um, I, I see that external plot, solving the mystery, as being the vehicle that moves the story forward. But it's the character relationships that bring readers in deeper into the story and make them feel the emotion, make them think. Um, and I, 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 that part, that process has worked out very well for me. And so the the, the books you have start to, uh, and I, I, I appreciate the way you describe that and talk about, um, you know, your deliberate approach um, in interacting with these characters and, and telling these stories. Do you end up, you know, now that there's six books, you know, along here, do you, do you get you feel any external pressure from say people who enjoy you know enjoy these characters that you know maybe want to want you to keep writing you know about these characters i mean do you do you have any tension as far as if you wanted to break off as a writer to create something new um as as you interact with your fans and people who love these characters do you feel any tension in that regard i don't um i'm in a very good place <clears throat> excuse me as a writer in that because I write about a community, I don't have to have my stories conform to a specific narrative voice or narrative style. Um, so if I wrote about a single protagonist, I think my readers would want to see that same story form in each novel. But because I, I write about a community, I can switch it up. So I have written in first person. I've written in third person. I've had single protagonists. I've had multiple protagonists. Um, I've gone back and forth in time. I've written about the present day. I, you know, nothing more dangerous it takes place in the past. It's actually a prequel. I have a great deal of freedom to write differently using different protagonists as I go forward. Um, also, I, I started this journey with the belief that you should, as Toni Morrison said, write the book you want to read. And I always have. I've always written the book that I would like to read. And I've never felt pressure to write a certain type of book or use a certain protagonist. Um, I have two books in my head. One I'm writing, the next, the other one I'm outlining that involve these characters going forward. But I have a third book in my head that has nothing to do with any of this stuff. I will write that book someday because I like writing. Um, if it doesn't get published, it doesn't get published. But I'm going to write it because that's what I enjoy doing. So um, I've been very lucky in that I have never felt any pressure to write a certain way. I just sit down and, and write what I think interests me. And so far, that's translated to a readership. It, it, there's there's a there's a, a character uh, we haven't uh, talked about, but um, I, I have lived in um, the Midwest in uh, Wisconsin, and uh, a lot of your uh, the settings are rather cold. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, what what's what's the role of um, you know that kind of Midwest uh, winter uh, Minnesota, um, you know the 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 woods, but also the city uh, in the winter. Um, uh, how do you think, how do you, I mean, is it deliberate that you, you bring that out? Because I, I feel it as a character. I mention it as a character. I'm not sure if you have in, in, in any spots, but it feels like an entity you have to deal with. And I really think it informs uh, your novels. You want to mention a little bit about the role of uh, yeah. <laughs> Minnesota in the winter? 
Yeah, and from a, from a foundational standpoint, um, when I sat down to try and learn the craft of writing, the first thing I had read was Joseph Campbell's A Hero with a Thousand Faces, because I want to understand the very fundamentals of storytelling. And so as I go forward and, and I'm writing, I will use weather as a character. For example, uh, in The Life We Bury, um, there's a scene where my protagonist, Joe, is running away into the woods, and it's right at the beginning of a snowstorm. Now, the blizzard that comes is what's called a, a threshold guardian. Um, a threshold guardian is a antagonist that the hero has to overcome before he can continue his journey to, uh, to confront the main antagonist. And oftentimes, when the hero overcomes the threshold guardian, the threshold guardian becomes a, an ally to the protagonist. So Joe runs in, into the woods, the blizzard is just starting, and he has to fight through this blizzard and survive it. And when he does, um, the blizzard then becomes an ally by hiding him in the woods from the, the guy he's running from. Um, so it's a threshold guardian. In the deep dark descending, um, it, the, the weather, the cold is a serious antagonist. I mean, that is one of the antagonistic forces that, um, that Max has to battle to, to have his journey. Uh, so yeah, when I'm, when I'm writing, I will often use weather as an antagonistic force or like I said, threshold guardian um, force because uh, it's here. I mean, <laughs> living in Minnesota, you understand how, how deathly important it is to understand the winters and the cold and the weather. Um, you know, you go out driving at the wrong time and it can be a life or death decision. So yeah, I, I, uh, I love using the, the weather when I can. I like the, um, and I really thank you for that. I mean, I really appreciate the description um, and the connection to the threshold guardian, uh, guardian. Cause um, you know, when I first asked that question, I just, you know, there's, there's this kind of blunt aspect of the weather makes you feel, you know, that it's, it feels almost always as the antagonist. Right. Um, but of course in, um, uh, in, in your work, that the fact that it can cover and it can hide, um, you know, that, that can help, help or hinder. And I, I think bringing in that, um, dynamic is, is really helpful actually for, for understanding its, um, uh, its role in your work. I've, um, uh, I, I've, I, as I mentioned, I've read uh, and listened to um, uh, each of your books, and um, I look forward to you know every time um, uh, one comes out. I think I think they're uh, incredible works uh, of art, and I uh, some of your references and descriptions, say the Tolstoy and Campbell. Um, I mean, I think there's kind of stronger universal elements um, to what you're doing. So uh, I view these. Uh, the the your your works is is uh, you know uh, pieces of literary art for you in interacting with the question of art is um what what is art to you um i, I will go back to tolstoy um i want to make people feel something whether it's enjoyment just you know because they they found the twists and turns of a novel interesting um, that's fine, but what I'd prefer to do is get down deeper. When I have someone write me an email saying, I just finished your novel, there are still tears on my cheeks, that is the most heartwarming message I can receive because I know I've touched somebody, I know I, that, that I've made them feel emotion. Um, and really, that, that's, that's why I'm a writer. That, that's really what I want to do is I want to make people think and, and feel things. So when I go to same museum, and there's a, a photographer that's, ha that's on display. Sometimes you look at the pictures and they're just pictures. Other times you, you look at a picture and you can feel something, you see something deeper and, and there's a, you can't always describe it, but there's an emotive feeling inside of you that something stirred by this picture, that's art. You know, when, when, I, when I look at um, paintings, um, if, if it's, you know, bowl of fruit probably doesn't do much for me but if it's if it's something that makes me feel something that's important so and again art is 
I believe in the eye of the beholder. If you like comic books and that's what makes you feel, or graphic novels, if that's what makes you feel, that's your art. Um, as, long, as long as it does you know, something inside of you that, that moves you, uh, that's, that's what I think the whole term art is for. I, I very much agree with Tolstoy. I wanted to, um, I, I, had, I had sent uh, sent you a message, Alan, um, uh, about uh, whether you could re- read a passage, which you've uh, volunteered um, uh, to do. I was wondering if you could um, give the listeners a little bit of a, a, a setup uh, to that passage and, um, and, and, and to perform that, that, that part for us, if you could. Sure. Uh, this passage happens about two-thirds of the way through Nothing More Dangerous. Uh, the protagonist in Nothing More Dangerous is Bodhi Sandin. He is 15 years old. Uh, the, the novel takes place back in 1976. And it's a story that has a lot of different moving parts to it. But the one moving part that really compelled me to want to write this novel is the journey that Bodhi will take to understand uh, his own subconscious prejudices. So he starts the novel out by saying very clearly that, that he has no prejudices, and he firmly believes that. He really believes he has no prejudices whatsoever, yet he will say things throughout the novel where the reader knows that this kid has subconscious prejudices. And so in this scene, um, Bodhi has befriended a young man named Thomas, who is black. And before this scene takes place, Thomas and Bodhi were walking down a dirt road and this pickup truck comes flying up out of the dust. As it drives past them, a man reaches out with a broomstick and swings at them and tries to hit them and actually hits Bodhi. And so Bodhi has t- has a neighbor named Hope Gardner. And Hope Gardner uh, is the mentor in the story. He's an older man. He's, got, he's a man with, with, with a dark past that Bodhi comes to, to understand over the course of the summer. But in this scene, he's telling he just told Hope about this attack. And in response, Hulk has told Bodhi the story of Emmett Till. And this this picks up the conversation after that story. Um, Three days later, they found the boy's body in a river with a cotton gin fan tied around his neck. Jesus. And all because they didn't like the way he talked to a white woman. But that was a long time ago, before I was even born. They put a stop to all that because they passed those civil rights laws. Bodhi, the men who beat and murdered those folks for all those years, do you think they simply disappeared because someone passed the law? Quiet sadness wrapped around Hoke's words as he spoke, as though he held himself responsible for the sins of people who came before him. Do you think those folks just figured out they'd been wrong and went home? No, but things are different now, ain't they? I wish to God they were, but that stuff still happens. Maybe not in the, in the same way it happened to Emmett Till, but it's out there. Always will be. Not always. People change. People change if they want to. But the sad truth is humans are hardwired to be prejudiced. It's passed down from ancestors who were just trying to figure out what to fear and what to hunt. We learn to separate things into good and bad, and that particular human frailty is alive and well in every one of us. It's not a bad or a If we have prejudices, we do. It's a matter of understanding those instincts and fighting against them. Oak pulled out his pipe and worked through the ritual of packing tobacco into it. I wanted to argue against what he had said, but frankly, his story about Emmett Till scared the crap out of me. And I began to contemplate the short walk between getting hit with a broom handle and getting beat to death with it. After he lit his pipe, he took a deep draw off the pipe and let the smoke roll out between his lips. Once it cleared away, he said, you'll never change what a person thinks in their head or what they feel in their heart by passing a law. If a man doesn't want to look at who he is deep down, he's not going to much care what the law says about it. And that's the end of the passage. Thank you. Um, What... what was what what was it like um, for you to for you to go back to go back in time with the, with your most recent novel um, and ability to change change in location and kind of to delve into um, you know the 
the the heart of 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 Bodhi. I mean, it is it was was it a difficult process um, to unravel? You know, what's in his what's in his heart and how he's feeling, or what you know what might be subconscious, unconscious prejudices. How was that he, process in writing that? It was both difficult and easy. Um, I grew up in Missouri in the 1970s. So Bodhi is really based on who I was uh, in that society in the 1970s. Um, and it, readers of my other books will know that in the current day, Bodhi Sandin grows up to be a law professor. Um, so he's a law professor in the life of Barry and in the heavens uh, may fall. And Bodhi has always been kind of my alter ego. He is kind of who I was at 15. He is kind of who I became after law school. So it was easy to go back and 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 get inside the shoes of that character because I was that character. Um, there's a lot of racial slurs and, and comments in this novel, and every one of them is one that I either heard or possibly said when I was in my youth. Um, and so it, in that in that way, it was easy to understand who Bodhi was. The hard part was getting it on the page. I started writing about Bodhi in 1992. So that, that short story that I began writing when I first got out of law school, that was nothing more dangerous. That was a story of Bodhi Sandin. So I actually wrote that youth version of Bodhi before I, I made him the law professor in the, my second, my, my debut novel. But it took me 20 years of studying and practicing and working to try and get this story where I wanted it to be. And it wasn't ready after 20 years. So I set it aside, wrote the life for Barry, wrote the three book arc for Max, wrote the sequel to the life for Barry, and then finally came back and rewrote nothing more dangerous. And after writing those other five novels, I had grown as a writer in terms of my understanding of what was missing in that first manuscript. Uh, and so when I went back to rewrite it, I didn't, I outlined it from beginning to end as if I'd never written a previous draft of it. And I wrote it um, from beginning to end, only looking at the old manuscript on occasion when I knew that there was a specific paragraph or a description that I liked from the old manuscript. And I would pull that forward, but I wrote basically the whole thing from scratch. Maybe 15% of the original manuscript made it into the final, um, final piece. So it took 27 years to get this book to a place where I knew it was ready to go. Um, and this is literally the book I became a writer to write. This is the story that I became a writer to tell. So that part was difficult, but I'm very pleased with how it turned out. Yeah, congratulations, Alan. I mean, <laughs> uh, it is it is quite incredible. And I, th I think I can connect to, you know, uh, it's just such a long time. I had read some bits and pieces about how long that story was there and for, you know, to to accomplish you know to accomplish this uh, must be a great feeling and I'm sure is a long time in coming <laughs> for you know for it to to be realized in the way uh, that it is it was uh, yeah, released no <laughs> yeah I, I, I'm sure I don't um, la uh, last week was released uh, last Tuesday is that correct Tuesday the twelfth so. Tuesday the twelfth yeah um so there's a there's a big question as part of the show um uh, and the, the question i ask is why is there something rather than nothing and um i always pose it in two 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 ways one is that you know as 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 an artist as a creator um you know why is why is there something uh, rather than nothing as far as what you create um or when does something uh, when does, you know, nothing become something as far as its genesis? But the question is, um, uh, for you, Alan, is, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah, I, I saw that in your email and I got to confess, I still don't quite understand the question. Um, why is there something rather than nothing in terms of, you know, my creating, as, as, as far as when I speak with, uh, creators, um, there's, uh, there's this usual, piece where in in the act of creating it becomes something you know like it was nothing or it was an idea it wasn't manifest before but you know like it's 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 essentially at what point do you feel that your ideas and your efforts um you know have become something for you as as a creator okay 
Uh, like you, um, I listen to most of my books uh, as opposed to reading them. I've never been a good reader, so I don't come to the world of writing novels as someone who has read a lot of novels. Uh, what I come to this from is a, day, a world of daydreaming. I have always been a huge daydreamer. I, that was my favorite part of school. And so when I decided to write novels, it was more, it wasn't so much, you know, let's try something fun, and write a novel. It was more, I'm always thinking about stories. I'm always thinking about, you know, creating, I'm creating stories in my head constantly. Let's write one down just for the fun of it. And really that's what it, that's how it's all started was I just wanted to write something down that was in my head. And it was the story of this young boy and it evolved over that first two decades. But the nature of it was I just wanted to take this daydream and try and put it on paper in a way that communicated these daydreams I was having. And then the more I learned about the, the art of and the craft of writing, the more I became enamored with that process. And so that that's how my my nothing became something is it's it just goes from my daydreams to let's see if I can communicate that daydream. Yeah. Did you um I I I, I read or seen a, a short video of you talking about that that daydream component, of course, which is kind of the creativity or the ideas or the imagination that you felt. Um, did you reach a threshold where you? you know, really just became comfortable with the fact that those daydreams were legitimate. I mean, you know, as a student, when you're younger, it's like, oh, you know, you're staring out the window, you're staring up in the clouds, you're dreaming. Um, when did you feel really comfortable saying, hey, you know, those those daydreams are, are my things and, you know, I'm going to create from them? When did that happen? It was an evolution that started when, I, like I said, when I got out of law school and started studying writing and started learning the depth of, of the craft. I mean, the, the craft of writing is really something that I didn't expect. I expected writing was, here's how you tell a good story. Um, you, you know, I understood that pacing was going to be an issue, how to do dialogue, those you know, mechanical things. But then there was a whole different level, a, a layer, layer of, of the psychological impact of how you write. You know, when when I have someone, like I said, email me saying that they were crying, they're crying because I know if I put these words in a certain way, it's going to have an impact. Um, and, and that became the joy of writing, is constantly understanding more and more about how to do that. I'm, to this day, I, I listen to podcasts on writing technique and screenwriting more now than before. And every time I listen to one, there's there's always a new tidbit. It's like, oh, that's brilliant. I you know I can add that to my my quiver of, of craft and ideas. I just it, there's a joy to it now. Of it's not just about me communicating. You know, here's here's a time I fell out of a tree, but making that mean something more than just me falling out of a tree. Yeah, Alan. Um... Uh, as, as part of this, um, uh, towards the end uh, of the podcast, one of the things I like to extend um, uh, to my guests is, uh, I, I think, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I think, I think your books are, are, are fantastic, um, and they, they really pull you in. Um, and I want to share that. Part of this is sharing kind of uh, your thoughts on, on the process and your answers to these questions. But if 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 folks listen and want to connect more to to you know to what you do and and what you write, um, what's what's their best avenues to um, just just encounter your work? Well, um, of course, they can find my books at uh, just about every bookstore and library in the country, um, or you can order them online. I I always strongly recommend people to to avail themselves of their local bookstores if they have one. Um, Local book, bookstores are a treasure, and if you have one in your community, support it. Um, beyond that, I have a webpage, alaneskins.com. I do have a blog there, but I honestly am not very good at writing on it. I, I haven't put stuff on there for probably a couple of years now. Um, but there's there's some videos on there and interviews that I've, I've done. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter, and uh, I got I got 
off their Facebook page. And I, I'm new to Instagram, but I'm on Instagram. So I always post little things that are new um, in those social media outlets as well. Uh, Alan, um, it, it's 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 been a great pleasure uh, chatting with you, and um, I want to you know personally uh, thank you for you know f- for all the hard work that I know you put in um, in 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 creating these books. Um, they're eminently enjoyable, and I uh, I think maybe I almost got into this automatic thing of the, in the fall when it starts getting a little bit chillier to be like, I think there's a, there should be a new Askins novel coming out and. Uh, I just want to let you know that I really appreciate um, uh, everything you do and for also uh, taking the time uh, uh, to join uh, the podcast here. Um, it's, it's, it's great and been a great pleasure to talk to you and also to learn um, uh, about your process and about, you know, some of the, the, the impacts, you know, on your life that have, you know, led you to, um, uh, to write and, and to create art. So, um, again, I wanted to extend a, a deep thanks to you, um, Alan. Well, I want to thank you for having me on. And I do want to give a heads up. Um, I've done a book a year, but in 2020, I will not have a book out. Uh, my next one will be out in 2021. Um, I've taken some time off to do some screenplay work, and um, that put me behind my year book a year schedule. Yeah, that'll, 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 you know, I mean, you deserve, you deserve to do that. It's also good to know. So to calibrate, uh, calibrate expectations. Um, uh, again, uh, thank you so much, Alan Eskins, um, author, um, and writer. And, uh, thanks for, uh, joining something rather than nothing podcast. Thank you for having me, Ken. Take care, Alan. You are listening to something rather than nothing.